Cell phones are absolutely amazing. Look at this guy, Dr. Martin Cooper. 1973, the very first cell phone was invented. That's not him in 73, this is much later. And that's probably not exactly the phone, but it's something like it. Going from that to this. And this is only an iPhone 5S. There's sixes out there, and maybe by the time you see this, something even better. How did it happen? How have we been able to embrace this type of technology? so quickly. Well, one thing is our ability to make microelectronics, our ability to make computer chips has increased, has doubled every two years. Moore's Law. And that's really the driver that's made the technology possible. But the sheer utility to be able to talk to somebody or write them or get long messages or documents or pictures and send it from any person to any person across the globe easily, inexpensively, has really changed the way we communicate, the way we think, and the way we interact across the world. It's a technology that has brought dramatic social change. Let's examine it a little bit further. Here is a map from 2006. And the colors represent how many phones per people? If we were in the darkest green here in 2006, this shows that something like Spain had as many cell phones as people. And you can see that uh, the US, Russia, the rest of Europe, Australia was not too far behind, but the developing world was very far behind. So this is 2006. First cell phones kind of for the masses, Late 1980s, 1990, they were big, they were bulky. There were car phones in the 80s because you had to connect it to a big power source like the battery in your car. But then could you actually take the battery with you and carry it out? I remember doing that in the late 80s. I had my bag phone. You had this big battery in this phone, but you could actually walk someplace and make a call. It was simply amazing. 2006 to 2012. 2012, now we have an interesting phenomenon. Yellow is 100%. As many phones as people. There we go in the U.S., something like 330 million of them. All right? To something up here in the orange, like Russia, more phones than people. All right? And people, a lot of people have two phones or so. Uh, in here, you can see Saudi Arabia, even uh, maybe approaching two phones per person. And in India which was at 10% coverage in six years, is close in that 100% band. We can not only just look by country, but you can actually look at the density of cell phone towers. And this is a fascinating map. You can see that Western Europe is absolutely covered and going on up here into Scandinavia. You might say, hey, how come North America isn't as covered? Well, remember, this is the Rocky Mountains, and nobody lives there. Uh, there's enough towers to cover all the people. Uh, and Canada, certainly every place people live, which is really close to the US border, you've got coverage. Uh, nobody lives up here. Russia is covered. It's just the population is less dense and is mostly over in this European and southern part. India is covered. Australia is not really deficient, it's just people live on this edge of the coast predominantly. You can see New Zealand. Same thing in South America, good coverage, except this right here is the Amazon. Not a lot of people in there, or cell phone towers. And then in Africa, Nigeria, this area here, fairly good coverage. South Africa, good coverage. Still, even though there's lots of people in this middle swath, uh, not much coverage at all. This is the Sahara Desert. China, again, good coverage, but China is predominantly inhabited along the coasts. So what about a cell phone itself? It's a computer. It's a bunch of microelectronic circuits. In fact, if we look at a cross section, you've got keys and a display, and the display is microelectronic based, and then you have the circuit board that has the guts of it, 
the things, the actual CPUs, and then things like the speakers, and of course, space for the battery. And all of this is compressed into a very small shape. And as the guts, as the microelectronics can get smaller, and as the display technology can get better and higher resolution, you can get more and more stuff into the same space. So we've seen how an actual phone looks and where their microelectronics fits inside of it. But we still don't have a good feel of how it works. In particular, how it finds you. Because of my work, I do a lot of traveling. So I'm in Europe, I'm walking along, and my phone rings. I didn't tell anybody I was in Europe. Yet, it could be my neighbor down the street or my mother calls me up and my phone rings. The people calling me don't really know where I'm at. In the old days, you wanted to call somebody in another country? Even today with landlines, I got to put in my country code. Oh, well, why not? first I have to tell the phone system that I'm calling international. I got to put in 011 in the U.S. Then I have to dial their country code and then their city code and then finally their phone number. And after a lot of clicks and bells and whistles and dollar signs appearing over your head because you realize how much this is costing, you could connect to somebody. Well, the way this works is because of these amazing devices, cell phone towers. And you can see that on the cell phone towers, these are the actual antennas that are transmitting to phones. Your phone works if you can draw a straight line between your phone and one of those. And it's okay to go through a few ceilings. You can't go through too many sheets of metal. If you're inside a metal box, you're not getting cell phone reception. But most buildings aren't metal boxes. Trees aren't metal boxes, right? So if your phone has a direct line to one of these, you're going to be on the system. And the cell towers can have a variety of shapes, variety of sizes, variety of heights. And they can even be disguised to look like trees. So how does it work? Well, the first thing is that your phone actually has three numbers associated with it. First, it has an electronic serial number. This is something that's hardwired on the phone itself. Every phone has a unique electronic serial number. It's not on the SIM card. The SIM card is what has your phone number, your mobile identification number not exactly your phone number, it's derived from your phone number, it's 10 digits. And every SIM card, because that's, that's you, that's the brain, that's things you bought from your carrier to allow you to get onto the system. Doesn't matter if it, you stick that SIM card into some other phone, that would then connect a different electronic serial number to that mobile identification number. There's one other important thing on that SIM card, it's a system identification number, SID. This is what is connected to the people you're paying. This could be connected to Verizon or to T-Mobile, right, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They have the system ID number. They've assigned you a mobile identification number. You've stuck it in the phone you bought from Nokia or Apple or Samsung, which has its electronic serial number. So, step A, you turn on your phone. You might not realize it, but your phone actually has two numbers in it. You see, it has what's called a control channel. And this control channel, as soon as you turn it on, it is going to try to find the SID of the nearest cell phone tower. 
So it uses the control channel and says, oh, here I am. I'm listening for signals, listening for signals, listening for signals. Aha! I found a cell tower. So if it finds the cell tower on the control channel, it checks to see, is it one of mine? In other words, does its SID, say its Verizon, match me? If it does, it says, yay, I found my home system. Of course, you might be what's called roaming, which means it didn't find its home system, but it found someone else's cell tower. It's okay. There's probably some economic arrangement between them to do this. It still is now connected to a cell tower, to the particular one that it's roaming to. Or, of course, if it can find no tower at all, it tells you you have no service. So, not only does it find this, but when it does find this, it does one other very important thing. It makes a registration request. It says, here I am with my number, my MIN, and I would like to be on your list, Mr. Cell Phone Tower. And dutifully, the cell phone tower, the brains in it, those little boxes you see up there, says, okay, you are on the list. And this is a big list. This is an incredibly big list. This list is called the mobile telecommunication switching office. Of course, like everything else, they have an acronym, the MTSO. It's an incredibly huge and very important file that's shared by everybody. It says at any one time, because this list is constantly changing, that all of the cell phones connected to a given tower, every cell phone that's registered itself to one particular tower is on that list. And of course the list also knows where that tower is and what's the best way to communicate to that tower. A tower in Tanzania? Okay, well first I've got to go to this place, this place, this place, then through some satellites to get over an ocean and then to this place, this place, and this place. So this is what happens when you turn on your phone. What about when you get called? Ring, ring, ring. How does it know? I call you, which means I know your mobile identification number, your phone number. I'm connected to a cell tower. My cell tower interrogates this master list. Every tower in the world has this same giant list. And you might say, what? We have like six billion cell phones across the planet. And maybe not that many towers, but obviously hundreds of millions of towers. Does I have a list that really has six billion numbers? Yeah, not a problem. That's a six gigabyte file, right? Maybe a bit more since there's 10 digits in the numbers. But that file is quite compatible with today's modern technology. Goes through that list does a quick search, just like if you're on the computer and you're searching your, um, your book and you say, I thought somewhere the, the guy said these words, you type these words in, boom, search, finds it. On the internet, you're used to search all the time. You type something in, boom, here's all the websites that have the search terms you're looking for. Same thing here. You put in the number, it finds it on the list. Because it's found it on the list, it knows what tower you're next to. That tower knows how to communicate back to other towers, and within seconds, within tenths of seconds, it has located where in the world that cell phone was. So, it now knows the route to connect your signal through the various towers to that signal. And not only does it search this database, right, but it then assigns you two frequencies. And those are the frequencies you're going to talk on. You might say, why two? Well, it's one for one person to talk and the other for the other person to talk. 
ever have to talk on a, a radio? And you say, hi, Jack, how you doing today? Over. You say over or something like that, so they now know it's their turn to talk. That's because those types of radios use one frequency. And you both can't talk at the same time. I'm sure you've been on your cell phone. You're talking, the other person's talking at the same time. You can't really listen that way, but it happens all the time in human conversation. Cell phones do that because there's two frequencies you're communicating on, one for your voice to get to them and one for their voice to get to you. These frequencies are in the band of approximately 820 to about 840 megahertz, millions of cycles per second. This band is higher than FM radio, which is around 100 megahertz and lower than microwave ovens, which are at 2.45 gigahertz. There's another communication band, approximately twice this, around 1900 megahertz. The frequency divisions can be very, very small, and since they only have to be unique within a certain tower, or the overlapping things of the tower, people across the world can be speaking on the same frequency, but they're not talking to each other because you're only broadcasting through the tower you're located near. And likewise, when you're talking on your phone, you're only connected to the tower you're talking to. These towers then transmit this between them through a series of passing on from tower to tower or sometimes from satellites, and it gets back on that particular frequency. There's lots of different modes and ways that they compress the frequency or have people talking in different ways. And those are very brilliant because it allows more and more conversations to be taken up by the same hardware and to allow it to be able to go faster. There's one last thing. What happens if you're in a car and you're fairly quickly moving from tower to tower to tower? Well, the towers are smart and so is your phone. As it sees the signal strength of its own tower decreasing, on that control channel, even though you're gabbing away, on that control channel, because there's like two conversations going on, there's your conversation and then there's the machine's conversation. And on that control channel, it's saying, oh, look, the signal strength of this other tower is getting higher and higher and higher. I think we're going to need to switch to that. So it communicates to the next tower. And does the same thing we did when we turned on our phone. It says, hey, is this new tower one of mine? Or someone we have an agreement with to use? Or are you going out of service altogether? And it will switch you in the MTSO from the one tower to the other one as soon as your signal strength has faded enough and the other one is strong enough. And now you've moved in this giant database registry to the new location which it now knows to keep routing your call through that way with no visible interruption to you whatsoever, at least ideally. If, of course, it goes to a spot where there's no tower at all, you got no service and your call's dropped. An amazing system that has crept up and become worldwide in the last 10 years. Be exciting to see what the future holds too. In recent years, phones have done another amazing thing. They tell you what the traffic is, which is tremendously useful because if you have some alternate routes, you could go someplace and you look at the route you're planning to take and it's a solid red line, that means don't go there. Find some other way. In fact, sometimes your phone's even smart enough to tell you and say, oh, I think you should take an alternate route if you really want to get to that destination. So I was thinking one day, how does it do this? Here's a picture of Chicago streets we took just now. You can see the red dashed lines and the darker the lines, and if the line is solid, that means the traffic is really bad. Well, the way it works is that remember how there's this carrier frequency that lets the tower know that your phone is in its area. Remember, you know this works because how does your phone know you have no service? or it does have service, or if it's roaming. It knows that because there's a frequency it communicates with to towers. 
and it's constantly going back and forth because you might leave the one tower area and go to the next one. So these towers have to constantly be signaling your phone. And they also have to know where you are. So the phone says, hey, he's here. Oh, now he's here. Now he's here. Now he's here. Now he's here. Does this at a regular interval. It knows the position at each point. Guess what? That means it knows your speed, your velocity. It knows how fast you're moving. There are a lot of people that don't move because they're standing still or in their house or their phones in their house at least or they're at work but there's a lot of people that are moving usually pretty fast 50 60 miles an hour 100 kilometers per hour because they're in automobiles and in the developed world probably every person who's in a car also has a cell phone in this way the cell phone towers of the world know how fast you're moving or at least they're taking that data and then some enterprising program like Google can take that and turn it into a velocity profile. It's also easy for them to then figure out if this is people on a street. You could say, well, I guess a whole bunch of pedestrians walking through New York is going to look like a terrible traffic mess. No, 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 because they're probably moving too slow and there's faster moving things right next to them. If all that traffic, which was moving 50, 60 miles an hour, starts slowing down, starts slowing down even more, they can make a signal that will go out to everyone who looks at a map that shows that change in velocity. I've been dying to do an experiment. And maybe you, my viewers, can do this someday. If you do, send me an email. Get a bunch of your friends. Go out sometime in the late evening when there's not very many cars on a stretch of highway. Don't do this on an interstate, it's probably very dangerous, but some highway, okay? And space yourselves out, like about a car's length in between. And then all start walking. I just wonder if you can get a red line to appear on the street. How sophisticated are their programs? Right. Even spacing of people with their phones, must that look like an even spacing of cars? And if you're all walking the same direction, does the program recognize that as cars on a street? But because you're going really slow, I mean, you can't walk all that fast, is it going to say, aha, traffic jam? I think it would be so fun to be walking along and all of a sudden the street you're walking on on your little map turns red and you did it. Anyway. Fun with cell phones and traffic apps. That's what you need to know.